Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by my friend Kyle Schneider to talk about power toms. Kyle, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bart. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. This is a really cool one. Uh, it's especially cool because you reached out as a listener of the show and just said, uh, you know, like a topic suggestion, which people do all the time and I love, and said, yep. uh, I think an episode on power toms would be really cool. And I, like, sometimes I respond to people and I go, yeah, that would be awesome. But like, how do you find a person to talk about that? Maybe there's powertoms.com or something. I'm not sure if there is. But uh, you then kind of took it upon yourself to do the research and put together an outline. And I think that is super cool that you did that. So I really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. That's one. Of, it's like a niche topic. You know, I think uh, sometimes it doesn't get discussed or it's it's quickly glossed over, I think, in the drumming community. So I thought this would be kind of fun to do. Yeah. Kyle, before we start, let me give a couple, there's some housekeeping stuff I want to do real quick, and then we'll hop in and kind of talk more about you and then get into Power Toms. Um, sure. So before we start, I want to give a big uh, thank you to Matt Waddell, who um, joined up on Patreon at a certain tier where he gets a shout out, and uh, his name now goes on the end of all the YouTube videos, and um, he works with Innovative Percussion, who does some really cool um, drumsticks and mallets and all that stuff. Uh, so he's going to be representing Innovative Percussion and um, representing the brand that way on the little card at the end of all the YouTube videos. Um, so if you want to get a shout out and promote your brand or podcast or shop or whatever, you can do that for 10 or 15 bucks a month um, and you'll get uh, on the end of all the YouTube videos. And then this is really cool. I want to give a quick mention to um, the the folks at Isotope because through Ben Hilsinger, who is at Big Fat Snare Drum and Big Fat Five and, you know, great guy. Uh, I was like, hey, Ben, you know them. Can you connect me with them? He set me up with Isotope. They gave me um, access to the brand new RX-10 advanced uh, suite, which is like not cheap and is a total upgrade from what I was doing. So I just want to give a big thank you and say that, uh, you know, anyone out there who needs that kind of thing, uh, which you do need that thing. Everyone needs it. It's awesome. <laughs> um, I've used it on every single episode. So thank you to Isotope for um, the RX-10 advanced license, which I love. All that being said, Kyle, let's hop in here, man. Let's start off a little bit with like who you are and why you love Power Tom so much and what got you into this. Sure. So uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me, Bart. Um, for all this, for all the listeners out there, I'm like you know nobody in the drumming community. I'm just the drummer, like everybody else. Um, yeah. So I grew up in the. Uh, I was born in the '70s. Grew up in the '80s and '90s. You know. So um, I have vivid memories of being um, um, just kind of attracted to drumming from a very very young age. Um, for example, I can remember way back all the way in like 1980. I was five years old, and um, I'd come home from like nursery school. And I'd, my brother, who's about four years older than me, I'd go raid his record collection while he was still in school. And I can remember putting on like parallel lines from Blondie and like just the super crisp drumming. I was like really drawn to that. And then listening to um, a live two from Kiss, you know, there was something about the fact that that live album just kind of puts you into that live immersive experience. And that just like drew me towards the drums. Um, sure. And I can remember playing with like pots and pans, like I think a lot of other kids did when they were young. And then um, fast forward about uh, 1985, like the spring of 85, um, one day uh, my brother comes home and puts on uh, Animalized Live on VHS. Before there was uh, DVDs and streaming VHS tapes, that's how he watched everything. Oh, yeah. And um, so Animalized Live was a very famous Kiss concert from the 80s. And um, Eric Carr was on the drums and his kit was just massive. Um, his style was just like monstrous, thunderous very kind of bottomish, kind of Zeppelin, very hard hitter. Uh, but he was really crisp and tight, and I was just drawn to him as a drummer. Um, and so throughout the 80s, you know, I just loved a lot of that kind of like uh, hard rock, heavy metal kind of music. And then I can remember in the August of 1989 is when I first went to like the first drum store in town. And uh, lo and behold, they had, there was a magazine called Modern Drummer. And uh, I said, what is this? <laughs> I said, up until this point, I thought the only magazines were like People Magazine that you see at the grocery store. I had no sure. idea, you know, these music type magazines existed. So I was totally floored. Um, so Chris France from the Talking Heads happened to be on the cover of that magazine. But within it, it had uh, product reviews for the Pearl Custom Z and the Pearl Export. And of course, all kids my age at 14, 15 drooled over that Custom Z. I mean, that was just like, oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, 
at no time was I going to be able to afford that as a 14, 50 year old no. kid. <laughs> um, but you know, I read the Pearl export review. They, I guess they had just had recently updated at that particular time. And, uh, so I was gravitating towards that. And then a couple months later, that same store had a brand new export kit in the store. And, uh, I scooped that kit up super quick as soon as I saw it. And uh, I played that for 31 years. Um, wow. also in the power time size, you know, that was a eight by eight, 10 by 10, 12 by 10, 13 by 11. So I had four racks, two floors, two snares or one snare. Um, but those, those exports were just so durable. They, they lasted yeah. forever. And if you can tune them well, you know, they would sound good. Good heads. I mean, I think the export is pretty much accepted as something that like changed the industry of, of good quality drums at an affordable price, which then I think all the other companies sort of had to step it up and not have their low end kits be, you know, junky, like throw away after a year kits. Um, sure. And man, you're so right about, I think they're that four piece, you know, jazz kits are just awesome. They're really cool to look at, but as a, you know, 12 year old, a huge double bass monster drum set with cymbals everywhere is sure. what sucks you in. I mean, that's like, it's just like looking at, it's like a kid having a Ferrari poster on their wall. You know, it's the same thing where it's like, you don't, you don't have like, uh, I don't know, a, a more practical car on your wall. <laughs> you have yeah. the, there's no Ford Taurus poster hanging up. It's, <laughs> it is, it is really, really, really cool. Um, yeah, that's awesome. For sure. So that kind of got me in the drumming. And so I've been playing ever since, you know, off and on here and there. And then we can talk about the kit behind me, you know, maybe a little later. But, you know, I thought before we get into like the history of power times, so let's just quickly identify, you know, what are power times in, in contrast to kind of the standard drums of today. Sure. Um, so in my opinion, you know, the, 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 sh the shallower the depth of the tom, you know, the, the shallower the note or the quicker the note, you know, the deeper the shells, the longer the note. Um, and it all comes down to preference, you know, uh, for a lot of drummers, you know, who like the shallow toms or sometimes I call them pancake toms because they're kind of flat. Um, you know, they provide a great sound. There's no denying that, uh, shallow toms provide a great sound. They just don't have the sustain that, um, the power toms have, you know, whereas power toms, maybe at times, depending on how you tune them, they don't have, um, that attack that you, you know, you might be looking for, but yeah. it also depends on the type of music you want to play. Um, sure. so I think those are the key characteristical differences uh between yeah. the two types of drums i think that's fair and we've talked about it before but like i guess it would be referred to uh as square sizes a lot right sure. meaning that it's 10 by 10 11 by 11 12 by 12 absolutely you know it's funny in doing um the research because you know a lot of this is i'm pretty good in long-term memory from when i was growing up uh, but i've done a lot of catalog research you know for this episode and when you look at any of the drum companies you know, over the course of 20 years you know they all go back and forth between listing depth by a dam diameter or diameter by depth. Um, and in some cases, you know, I'll hit on it just a little bit later. Um, I really had to stare at these catalogs for a while because I couldn't tell which was listed first in, you know, some of the yeah. tom sizes. I was scratching my head for a minute. I'm like, did they make this size? You know, <laughs> very confusing, but A yeah, plus for creativity. Yeah. I mean, at a certain angle, you're like, you're looking at it and they're all big. They're all big sizes. So it's hard to tell. I mean, if it's a four by 12, that's pretty clear what's sure. what. But if it's a 12 by 14 versus a 14 by 12, that's like difficult to tell. So um, sure. Yeah. And uh, I will say for anyone, uh, if you're listening on, you know, the podcast platform, like, you know, going running or whatever you're doing, walking the dog or something, we, I, I'm going to have um, photos that Kyle provided of a lot of the drum sets um, in the YouTube video of this. So you can check that out as well. And he has a monster, awesome, beautiful, custom dream kit uh, uh, pearl set behind him, which, uh, like he said, we'll talk about later because I know that's a cool process of how you got it. But um, sure. So, Kyle, let's let's uh, I'm looking at your outline here. What, let's let's go to the, the part here. What is the genesis of power toms? Sure. So. And then, again, this is just all my research, my interpretation. So if people want to counter that, no problem. I take no offense. Uh, but I believe the birth of power toms came into being in 1980. Like for me, that is the definitive year of the power tom. Um, however, I'd say probably 12 to 15 years prior to that, the evolution of those began. Um, you know, it just took a little while for the drum companies to get there. You know, that seemed to be the final evolution in like drum making in terms of sizes, if you will. 
for like everyone knows like louis belson was the first one to play a double bass kit or he's the first credited person you know as a famous person to play double bass back in 49 or 46 so even way back then you know he was like kind of had a vision you know that was from a visual perspective looked amazing you know yeah. um uh but of course everyone doesn't you know the practicality of moving that stuff around and whatnot uh but it provided the the vision of what could be and then so fast forward into the early 60s you know you've got the great charlie watts and um ringo you know they have their their ultimate four piece sometimes five piece you know depending on what they were doing um kits and that that when you think of the 60s a lot you know that's the vision that i get you know by looking at uh charlie watts or ringo's yeah. kit you know they're very indelible mark you know of for drumming for sure and uh you know to their credit you know they never kind of deviated they always st stay stuck with their particular um their particular drums and methods of how they how they played but as you get into the later 60s you know you see uh artists like john bonham who usually had a five-piece kit he had one rack two floors uh but he was playing a 26 inch bass drum which was pretty big at the time and his rack time generally was like a a 14 by 10 or uh even to 15 by 12 at times you know i think he interchanged the sizes a little bit here and there yeah. um but for that particular time 69 70 1969 70 you know those were huge toms you know yeah. that's a that's a pretty monster tom so and then you have other artists uh in the 70s like um carmen apiece um and neil smith who played with uh, alice cooper and billion dollar babies who had massive kits he's got like um like eight nine rack toms on his on his kit uh, but not power time sizes yet. They're still shallow in the traditional sense of of Tom Toms. Um, sure. And I think of like Nick Mason from um, Pink Floyd, who like there's like, you know, the live at Pompeii thing where he's got the Ludwig set, the silver sparkle. And he's got yep. they've got I think he had two two Toms in the middle of the bass drums and sure. um, two floors. But yeah, they're not really they haven't gotten deeper. But Bonzo definitely did. Carmine Apiece definitely getting bigger. Um, so it's interesting. And I guess it goes without saying that the music sort of dictates what's happening where you have more toms, you do more, do, 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 you do more, you sure. know, the music's getting heavier. There's more stuff you can do. So yeah. Yeah. More, more melodic fills and interesting yes. things you could do. Like you can be the most phenomenal drum in the world, but at, at the end of the day, if you only have a four piece, it doesn't matter if they're power toms or shallow, you only have four different tones you can create out of. Yeah. I mean, I think that that is the debate too of like, are you a and I this is like a rhetorical I don't even think this is a real question but it's the thought I think some people have of if you have a bigger drum set it means you're a better drummer which yeah. I don't think that's true I think you can I, be I a, agree amazing player but I think if like you know someone who doesn't really play that much or just kind of like you you'd look at it and go oh they're better because they have a ton of drums versus like you know Max Roach playing a small four-piece kit or something which we all know is not true, yeah. but it's just an interesting thought. You know, that definitely sure. conveys, oh, you're a better drummer. You've got two bass drums, five toms, two floors, uh, concert toms over here. It's it's like psychologically different. Yeah, I think maybe for people who aren't drummers, you yes. know, they, maybe they'd be more inclined to believe that. But, you know, I think any drummer certainly is, uh, you and I would agree, Bart, you know, yes. one drum, one drum, your kid still be a phenomenal drummer. Absolutely. I mean... I think it and I think uh, drummers know that like what's most impressive is being able to like the classic videos of Buddy Rich holding down and playing a solo just on a snare drum. Unbelievable. That's what's like or just doing Max Roach on just the hi hat. It's like so, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's it's all about the drummer. But anyway, carry on. Sure. So going back. So like you said earlier, Bart, you know, you kind of the square size is 10 by 10, 12 by 12. You know the sizes of the time the traditional sizes which are you know highly in vogue today you know we're talking about uh so i'll try to i'll try to stick with diameter by depth throughout our podcast okay. if i if i deviate i'll, I'll try to remember to fix it <laughs> yeah. um but we're talking about like uh for rack toms you know eight by seven ten by seven or ten by eight twelve by eight um, thirteen by nine um sometimes you see a thirteen by eight um fourteen by ten those are pretty much the standard sizes for today um, and as they were back then, those were standard sizes. Certainly as the early seventies grew, you, you started to see more like 13 and 14 inch toms on, on those drum sets. Um, but initially, you know, you'll lot of see a lot of, uh, 10 by eight or 12 by eight, those type of sizes, um, gotcha. which have a great sound, a lot of attack on those, you know, they sound great. So I thought we'd talk, uh, try to go over a couple of different, um, 
drum companies and like what what was being offered at the time. So initially, we, you know, I kind of mentioned like uh, Ringo had his Ludwig and Charlie played his his Gretsch kit. So Pearl, you know, when they came out with the President Series in '67, you know, there's still only a four piece or so. But in 1969, Pearl comes out with what's called the Big Shot outfit, um, and this was a double bass kit, pretty uh, like the first double bass shell pack they put out at the time. Um, still with the standard sizes of bass drum of um, 20 by 14, um, 12 by 8, and 39 uh, tom toms, and a 1664 uh, tom. And then just a couple of years later in 74, now they release the double nine, which is a like the nine piece double bass kits that we kind of know that were in vogue, certainly at the 80s, like with those shell packs. Um, this yeah. one was interesting because in the double nine, so now they're going. With a bit bigger bass drum, you've got a 22 inch by 14 instead of a 20 by 14. Just from a couple years prior, you still have a 12 by 8. But this one, they have two 13 inch rack toms on the kit. So you got a 12 by 8, a 13 by 9, another 13 by 9, and then a 14 by 10. So I thought that was interesting. You yeah. Know, of course, you can tune drums high and low. So I mean, as a drummer, you could. I would assume you would probably tune one of those on the lower side, one on the higher side. Give a little more variety. Um, interesting choice though yeah yeah that was the, the only time i saw in any of the catalog research where they would have the same drum within the shell pack um very interesting mm. so uh the following year i think around 75 the finally pearl comes out with the called their double 10 setup which is basically the con a concert tom drum set which we all know the traditional sizes of concert times like six by i think it's five and a half eight by five and a half and uh you know so on and so forth so i think they finally get up to like a 16 by 14 inch tom but they're concert toms with no bottom heads uh, with bass drums and a floor tom. So now you're seeing like pretty basically, you know, that's the power tom kit of the 70s is, you know, these, um, their tunables or the concert tom kits, you know, where they fully explode. And, yeah, you know, you have the full tone range of all these of all these sounds at your disposal. And then Pearl, a few years later in 1980, you know, they released the Genesis, which is a really short lived kit for them. I think it was only out for about two years. And the Genesis is their first true power tom kit similar to the one behind me um they had eight rack toms uh just one floor and two bass drums um but more specifically so it was a six by eight an eight by eight and then a ten by eight so still some a little shallow uh 12 by 10 13 11 14 by 12 a 15 by 14 and then they went back to the square size and went with a 16 by 16 tom tom for their final for the largest rack tom um and then now you're seeing a 22 by 16 inch. So now we're about five years later after those um, uh, double 10 setups. And so we, now we've gone, we started out around 1970 with a 14 by 20 to a 22 by 14. Now around 1980, we're at a 22 by 16. So you can see the bass drum is just kind of gradually pushing out yeah. you know, in depth. Um, and, and in the 1980s, you know, 22 by 16 was the size of the day, if you will. Sure. This is interesting too. Looking at the picture of it here, it's it's uh once you get to the larger, literally like the the mounted tom, the largest end to before you get to the floor tom are basically just mounted floor toms. I mean, they're sure. huge. Um, yeah. And you said what they were fourteen or on this or a, a sixteen? Yeah. The, uh, for that Genesis, that's a sixteen by sixteen inch mounted tom tom <laughs> floor tom, if you will. So it we, might be it's yeah. a little lighter because there's no brackets for the. Uh, for the legs, but oh, true. So that's well. What I'm getting at too is is the the hardware that's required to mount that thing, sure, and get everything set up in the right spot. Uh, we're pretty early in you know uh, rely in the the days of reliable hardware, which Pearl yes. always had pretty good hardware as far as yeah. I can tell, and you know brands like Ludwig, which obviously they got way better, but um, I had an old huge rocker set, um, rocker two, I think. And mm -hmm. that had horrible hardware <laughs> where everything was always falling and everything was breaking. You'd have to go and use a wrench to tighten it. But, um, yeah, I mean, these are giant mounted floor toms. Basically, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, they're fun to see. I'm sure, like you said, you know, hard to position. And if yeah. you're in a touring band with that, you know, having extra hardware, God forbid something snaps or breaks, you know, can't even use that anymore for the night until you can fix it. Yeah. Um, and then, like you said, we're still kind of in the early stages of hardware development, if you will. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna move gears over here to Tama, yep. uh, and I only learned it's actually called Tama by listening to your Tama <laughs> episode. Up until that episode, I always thought it was Tama, and I'm 
I said Tama character. for a, a long time. I said pasty as a kid. Um, I don't think anyone cares. You know, they know sure. what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so Tama, um, a little bit different. You know, they come on the scene in the, in the early 70s as well. In 77, they have their Superstar series, which is a nine-piece uh, kit, a shell pack. So you've got 12 by 8, 13 by 9, 14 by 10, and a 15 by 12. This is the first time I've seen a 15-inch drum in a shell pack. Um, and now it has the 16 by 16 and 18 by 16 floor times, which we all use today. Yep. And then, um, so that's really the precursor to their power Tom series of drums. Um, however, just before Tom launched their kind of power times in the, in the early eighties in 1980, they come out with their Titan series stands, which are like super heavy duty hardware. I mean, just looking at the photos from most, you can really tell like they look sturdy, and those drums on that are not going anywhere that you mount on there. Yeah. Um, so they almost kind of did it the right way in terms of they put the hardware out first. And then basically the following year, Tama comes out with their Power Time series um, mm. for like yeah, to, um, to hold it, <laughs> to hold yeah. these giant drums, hold all that weight. So they yeah. called, uh, so Tama calls them around 1982, they're extras, Tama extras. And uh, I wrote it down. So it's uh, extra power, extra depth, extra new, Tama extras. And so this is the, the birth of the power toms for Tama. And um, this is really interesting. You know, all the drum companies all had like a little different flavor in terms of power toms and the sizes they were offering. Um, so for Tama, uh, you have an eight by nine. So an eight inch diameter, nine inch depth on, right. the, on the rack tom, a 10 by nine di depth, excuse me, diameter by depth, 10 inch diameter, nine inch depth. And now we have a, this is not a typo, 11 by 10. 12 by 11, 13 by 12, 14 by 13, 15 by 14, all rack toms. So the anomaly here is the 11 by 10 tom tom. Yeah. And uh, I thought this was a typo. I found this in several of their catalogs in their, um, I want to say their Art Star and Crest Star. I could be confused. All their Star series kind of blend together a little bit. Sure, of course. Um, however, I, I reached out to Tama and I want to give them all the credit because they actually they got back to me and I asked them, I'm like, hey, is this a typo? I have never seen or heard of an 11 inch Tom Tom. And they said, yes, we made them for a couple of years. So if you're a drummer out there with an 11 inch diameter Tom Tom, hold on to that sucker. You know, those are kind of rare. I've never seen yeah. one before. Um, and then, of course, I a step further, I'm like, well, if you own this, are there any heads available for this? Because uh, so I reached out um, to a couple of drum companies and Remo uh, still makes an 11 inch uh, diameter drum head so if you're if you have one of these remo for sure makes them they got back to me and they i specifically asked them and uh they said yes they do and you can get them in a couple of different varieties hmm. um so That's if you're awesome. a drummer yeah you got a 11 inch drum it's interesting how the uh drums getting bigger and the things and and the music changing does affect other parts of the industries like drum heads have to get bigger they they all sort of sure. have to keep up with each other uh you know to keep the hardware and everything working together very very symbiotic uh, yes, exactly those. um and then also you know one of the things i'll mention is um certainly with tama um not only are the drums getting bigger but they're getting thicker you know drums are much thicker and heavier now so now you've got for their uh for like the grand star series which was a pretty big deal for them in the 80s um their toms were six millimeters and then nine millimeters in thickness on bass drums so they're getting a little bit thicker they're getting bigger they're getting thicker getting heavier um, everything's heavier <laughs> everything's getting heavier uh so sonar is like the classic example of not only power toms but like heavy drums so we'll, we'll just backtrack this real quick and back to the 70s for their kind of quick evolution so they had uh their championship series in the 70s so they had like again 24 or excuse me 22 by 14 inch bass drums so they start out with the smaller traditional bass drums in the early mid 70s of the time um, 12, 8, 13, 9 Tom Toms. And then later on, just a couple years later in 78, they have their Phonic series, which they release a five piece shell pack. So, not big hard rock drum set in terms of number of drums. But I thought this was interesting because it was kind of a step forward. Um, you've got a 13 by 9 and a 14 by 10 mounted Tom Toms in that shell pack. So, uh, 13 and 14 inch drum. You know, you don't see that often. In fact, I don't even know in the 80s you saw that very much. Like, usually those were yeah. add-ons. You, or you'd have to get, like, the full nine-piece to get those bigger drums. 
Um, yeah. But here, the here sonar was is in the seventies with a five piece. Here you go. Here's a you know thirteen fourteen inch drum. As we're going through, it's interesting to kind of because each company sort of like uh, with their in, unique things that they bring to the market kind of raises different questions of of it's 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 always kind of people usually think of to have a power tom drum set. You visually instantly go to a drum set like yours sure. or one of these huge the rocker whatever these huge double bass mega drum sets, but by uh, definition, a power tom drum set does not refer really to the number of drums. It could be a four-piece kit, fair to say, right? Like it could be a one-up, one-down power tom kit. For sure. Totally agree. Absolutely. Interesting, yeah. And generally, though, like you, they're never usually photographed in that way, you know, for catalogs and things like that, but um, but you're absolutely right, yeah, and the you can mix and match. Maybe have power time with a shorter floor time, or you know, vice yeah. versa. Um, yeah, that's what's so great about the drums. It's so individualized for every drummer. Like, there's no such thing as the wrong setup. It's whatever you want to play is that works for you. Then hey, then that's totally. that's what works for you. Yeah, and and I th- I think of like just you know as on that note before we move on, just like you you think of drummers like Dave Grohl who has a four piece set with a deep uh, power tom and a big floor tom on like a four piece kit. You know, sure. and I mean, it would be him or um, I always think back to, I guess, I think the drummer in uh, in Wayne's world. There was some shots of uh, the drummer in Crucial Taunt playing. I'm pretty sure he was using <laughs> Power Tom setups sure. um, on a smaller setup and thinking on that. And we talked a little bit about this before, but how yeah. drummers using white Yamaha kit and then in the uh, music store, Garth is using the all put together Power Tom huge. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I forget what model that was. That might have been a recording custom. But anyway, what I'm saying is maybe it was the same drum set. They just used different smaller pieces for the music video shoot or whatever. Oh, sure. Um, maybe that's a little Wayne's World conspiracy that can uh, spread around the <laughs> internet. But <laughs> well, yeah. I'll have to Google right. that when this is over. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So now we're in the early 1980s. So, so uh, sonar um, just goes like way over the top with um, the the power times, you know, so they come out with their signature series in I think around 1982. And these are 12 fly drums. These are big and heavy, heavy drums. Um, so they have six by eight, eight by eight. And now we're going all square sizes, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Those were all mounted tom toms, all the square sizes that we know. And then towards the end of the 80s, mid to late 80s, uh, Sonar comes out with their signature light series, which Exact same sizes, but you know it's reduced in weight um, a number of plies. So they said it was fifty percent lighter. So for example, instead of being twelve millimeters in thickness, now we're at six millimeters in thickness. Which, by today's standards, six millimeters is still on the. It's not super thick, but it's definitely on the thicker side of drum shells, and a lot sure. of them are four and a half or five. You know, with the um, reinforcement rings in there. But still much lighter than a six inch, um, or excuse me, six millimeter uh, type shells. So yeah. they really, you know, went for it. And then Sonar has, and I had I have to find it here because I had to write it down because this is where I had to look at the uh, the catalog a couple times. We're like, what sizes are these? <laughs> is it depth by a diameter or diameter by depth? And um, so, in talking about their floor times, they've got uh, they had like. 14 by 12, 15 by 13, 16 by 14. Um, and then they had a, they actually had a 20 by 18. So that's the first time I saw a 20 inch floor time. I mean, essentially that's a bass drum, a 20 by 18 inch floor time. The, 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 the niche with those are, um, they never came in any of the shell packs, you know, so you had to buy that as an add on to any of the kits that you purchased at the time. So just like the, um, the, uh, the 11 inch Tama mounted Tom Tom, the sonar 20 inch floor time is another one of those hard to find uh drums around there so if you've got one yeah no shortage of drum heads because there's so many 20 inch bass drums out there um so enjoy that thing and i would hold on to that if i had 20 inch floor time i would would definitely hang on to that so uh switching gears so we'll move over to uh ludwig you can't talk about power times without talking about uh ludwig drums and so so we go from the 60s with Ringo into the seventies with, you know, a lot of the great drummers again, like, um, Vinny, Vinny apiece and, um, you know, all those massive kits that they have bottom of course. And then in 1980, they come out with what they call their, it's funny. They call them aerial toms in 1980, 
And this was in their 1980 catalog, but this was buried way down on page 26 for considering this was essentially a new line of drums at the time. Um, it wasn't kind of towards the front where it would catch, you know, the most attention. Um, and they called them their aerial toms. And so this was actually buried way down on page, I think it was like 26 of their catalog. And so for the company to come out with essentially a new series of drums, mm. um, I thought it was odd that it wasn't, you know, more in the uh, uh, forefront. Yeah, because these are essentially um, just super deep concert toms, you know. Uh, so now we have this is where it gets a little bit different. So now we have still going by diameter by depth. You've got a six by nine and an eight by nine, so six inch diameter yeah. by nine inch depth. Um, and then they go not quite uh, square sizes, but you've got twelve by eleven, thirteen by twelve, uh, fourteen by thirteen, fifteen by fourteen and 16 by 15 inch, those were all rack toms. Um, so I thought this was interesting because this is the first time, uh, with the exception of rocket toms or octobons, whatever you want to call them, sure. you've got a tom tom that the depth is greater than the diameter for a regular shell, you know, which causes, uh, in general, like you know, a higher pitch. Pearl has the Genesis in 1980, so that's a six inch by eight inch, six inch diameter, eight inch depth. And then Ludwig goes one step further with a six inch by nine inch depth. So a little bit more kind of rocket Tom octobon type of type of, type yeah. of drum. Um, you know, and, and, and just by chance, I have the Lud the 1980 Ludwig uh, catalog downloaded and have it pulled up and mm -hmm. it is page 26. You were completely oh. correct. My memory um, me. <laughs> <laughs> I have this up because I've been working on a John Bonham episode, which will be out before this. So people have probably already have heard it, hopefully. But um, sure. It's interesting because they're calling double-headed. Uh, they're calling it a double-headed power tom tom, um, which it's just kind of like even that. Um, and there's single-headed power tom toms as well, which they have a blue vista light power tom, which is neat. But just the the nomenclature of power tom is kind of used in um, in like their catalogs and things. So that's in eighty, yeah. I guess that term power tom is already a part of the like culture. It is. You you start seeing that throughout the 80s, 82, 83, you know, all those, like even Pearl, like for their, I think it was for the export, but I think it was for a lot of their series, you know, they show the 8x8 and 10x10 kind of add-on pack, and they call them the Power Tom add-ons, if you will. I wonder who coined it first. I'm sure you could probably go look at all a bunch of catalogs and go who was the very, very first, but then it probably just kind of was one of those things where marketing people said it and it just kind of stuck, but uh, sure. I wonder who was the very, very, very first, you know? It's funny, if you ask Pearl or Ludwig or Sonar, they'll all say they did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay. Um, cool. Yes. So throughout the 1980s, you'll see like the Ludwig rocker kits and uh, the Pearl GLXs and MLXs. You know, all those kits are all full. Most of the time, you'll see them like nine pieces, four racks, two floors in those sizes. And towards the end of the 80s, you also start seeing 22 by 18 inch bass drums. So now the bass drums are getting pushed out just a little bit further. And so... We're just kind of moving along in the evolution of drum sizes once again. You know, power times kind of get a, I'll say a bad rap, but they're kind of stuck in that niche of like, when you think of power times, like hair metal and like the big 80s metal music kind of comes to mind, which totally accurate. A lot of those bands, you know, use those types of drums, but, you know, those sizes are also used with other bands and other artists. Um, it's not just specifically for that niche, but, you know, that just... I think those two in particular, Power Toms and like some of the hair bands of the time, you know, were symbiotic as well. They each kind of pushed each other and reinforced what they were. So, um, yeah. so towards the end of the 80s, getting into the 90s, as the music changed, you know, as there was kind of a backlash to that, you know, Nirvana overnight, you know, ended all the 80s kind of hair metal in one file swoop. So did kind of the Power Tom massive kits go away. And that's where, yeah. as you talked about, Bart, we're talking about the, um, you can still have a power time, but you don't have like 12 drums. You might have a four piece like Dave yeah. Grohl did. You know, he had a, it looked like it was like a 12 by 11 or a 13 by 12, that one rack time that he was using uh, in Nirvana. It's like a four piece. Yeah. And then uh, I think for me, like uh, for the, for the final kind of, I think 80s kind of cap into the 90s for power times, I, I go back to the, uh, the Pearl Custom Z. You know, I can remember seeing the ads everywhere. It said, uh, for those who consider drumming an art, and art welcome to the ultimate canvas and you saw that that nine piece with all those square sizes on it and that beautiful champagne bird's eye or whatever's 
that was just gorgeous. I think everyone's jaw hit the floor when that came out. I was like, I would love that kit. Oh, I'd love it too. I mean, it's just beautiful. They, they, there's so much just like real estate taken up. I mean, this drum set's massive. And this particular picture, which, uh, you know, again, if you're on YouTube, you see it. If you're listening, just to describe it, it's a huge drum set. But these have the classic, I think I tried it once as a kid. It's got the classic mm -hmm. like cymbal boom arm going upside down with a cymbal yeah. hanging kind of inverted how it normally would. It's plain normal, but that was such a classic catalog thing from from those yes. days. Did you ever, have you done that? Like, have you done that on your own kit? Uh, I, I have not in many years. Um, I did try that a couple of times. I know like Peter, Chris, and a couple of other drummers actually use that in how they set their kit up. Uh, sometimes I think yeah. it's actually due to necessity and how they got the kit with the toms. But um, yeah. I found that I haven't, I haven't had a need to do that. So I uh, just haven't done it, but it does. It's pretty effective. You know, it works. It looks cool. I mean, yeah. in a catalog, it's kind of this like, 90 degree angle coming in straight and then symbols going down and you're like it's as a kid you're like i didn't know you could set it up like that and i'm sure you experiment and, and stuff like oh that. sure yeah i do yeah. try to experiment like especially with this one behind me i'm always tinkering with it try this try that you never yeah. know see what works yeah. best yeah so i think that was like the last kind of that was the last power tom kit in my opinion is the custom z i think that went from like 89 to around 92 94 somewhere in that area and then um then you start seeing, you know, the musical chase, you know, are changing in the early mid nineties. And, um, as a result, you know, the drums become smaller in number of drums on the drummer's drum set. And then eventually they start becoming smaller themselves. You know, I think with the exception of like, like we talked about with like Dave Grohl and then like Art Lars Ulrich of Metallica, he, and you know, during the, the black album tour, he had that awesome nine piece white drum set with the 15 inch rack time on there. And then by 96, Lars was down to a seven piece, which was still a pretty big drum set at the time, but he definitely was using those smaller rack times like 12 by eight, you know, 13 by nine, something a little bit smaller. Um, yeah. I think maybe try to distance themselves a little bit from that kind of hair metal kind of eighties look. Um, sure. and of course they sounded great. You know, those, those drums still sound good. Yeah. Um, so that's the end of the, the, the power Tom, as we know it, as it, it's, it, would you call that it's golden era? It was like 80 to 90, basically? I would, yeah. Into the early 90s, that was certainly was the golden era of uh, power toms. Um, and you can see it in the catalogs, you know, even as uh, even in 2000, in the early 2000s, um, the drum companies were pulling away from, you know, showcasing those types of drums in their catalogs. But if you looked in um, either the price guides or if you went to like where they actually list all the sizes – you would still see them listed in there, but you wouldn't actually necessarily see them in the photos per se, like if you were just flipping through the catalog real quick. So they were still offering a variety, but they didn't necessarily show. So I think um, for drummers today, you know, I think I think in the last three or four years, you know, my opinion, I think you see a lot of these power time kits on social media now and um, a lot of them, but they're all retro, they're all older, you know, they're not brand new. So I think for some brand new drummers today or people just getting into drumming, you know, maybe they don't realize that you can actually still get a new drum set in these sizes. You don't have to be a tier one level artist or in a band or, you know, for any particular drum company to get those sizes. You can, like me, I'm just a nobody, you know, you can still get those sizes. They're still available. Yeah, you can get anything you want. I mean, they'll, if you pay for it, someone will, <laughs> someone will make it. This is true. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. So that answer is on the outline here. You have questions of, does anyone still play them and do any manufacturers still produce them? Which you just answered, which yes. I mean, of course you sure. can get them, but um, anyone with the, anyone still playing them, are there any artists that you really like now that are like really, you know, being a good ambassador to the power Tom movement? I think so. So there's still a couple like uh, John Larson from Volbeat. Um, he's still playing power Toms. He's got a, he's using the four big Toms, 10, 12, 13, 14. And then of course the, in my opinion, the grand ambassador for all Power Tom players, Power Tom Strong since like 1983, is the great Nico McBrain from Iron Maiden. Yes. He has not deviated from his setup <laughs> at all since no. since back in the day. So he carries the flag for all his Power Tom players, I think. <laughs> I mean, really, though, that's like, as you said, tier one drummer. Are you, I mean, probably one of the biggest drummers in the world, obviously. But like, uh, sure. you know, having a tech to set everything up, because if you go gigging it's not 
I mean, even the stage size, obviously they're playing arenas with Iron Maiden, but like, sure. um, you can't really, I think every drummer in their life has shown up to some sort of a gig with a ridiculous sized drum set and the sound guy is just like rolling his eyes and you've taken up 80% <laughs> of the stage. And you're but, like, what's the problem with that? <laughs> yeah. What's the problem? Yeah, exactly. Like your simple, your crazy eighties symbol stand is like poking your guitarist in the back, but yeah, he's a great ambassador though, and and uh, and y- you need that. The children need to see he's a it's representation, you know, sure. like and you need to see that. Oh, I could do that. Which uh, I mentioned it this this to you before, but like I've played a four piece kit for a long time, and it's mm-hmm. it's great. But I do really, I honestly think I am like sick of it, and I want mm-hmm. more toms. Not even sure. to say that I want specifically power tom sizes i think it'd be cool because you i guess you could technically kind of have like a hybrid of like a couple normal traditional size toms and then get into power tom sizes as you get further down sure um but man i think i played a gig where i filled in for someone a year or two ago and he had a pacific kit that was like three ra- it was probably like eight ten eight and a ten over by themselves and then uh 12 probably 14 and then a 16 floor and it was awesome just to have those little toms and just to go around it's like it's a lot of freedom you know sometimes it's like i don't know i like i like the four piece four piece is great but it is more fun in my opinion to have more toms to play around on if some is good more is better (laughs) now now if you're in a band if you're a drummer in a band then obviously you should play for the song not for yourself uh, yes. Always serve the song first, uh, and, and don't get too self indulgent. Um, but you know <laughs> yeah. if that works for the music. You know if you're like Mike Portnoy or Mike Mangini, then you can go nuts because that music allows you to have that kind of musical freedom to kind of dance around the kid a little bit. Totally, yeah, so, yeah. Mike Portnoy is a great representative of of just big drum sets in general because everyone watched those videos of his as a kid and like like anyone but that one sticks out to me as like you know oh my god that's so and then there's like an auxiliary hi-hat over here yep. which raises the question of um the watch outs i think with these big huge giant drum sets of mm-hmm. these super deep toms i mean you got to raise things up a little bit higher because your bass yeah. drum and there, there's more finesse of like the ergonomics of doing this right i mean what's your experience with getting set up right and you know sure. your hi-hat and your legs are super spread apart uh, for me personally I've, I've had a double bass kit ever since my export you know back in the day and um i find it pretty easy uh, on this one i only have a two-legged uh, hi-hat stand and so i i've been doing this my whole life so i have my heel on my hi-hat stand and my my front part of my foot on the bass drum pedal and i find it very easy to kind of go back and forth sure. but i've been doing it forever um but for some people that might not work for them they need to have them like right up next to each other. Um, but I haven't, I don't find that a problem. And then a lot of times, like if I'm playing the ride, a lot of times it's, it is in the chorus section. So I can kind of twist to my right, just the hair. Cause my right symbol is a big extended out, um, over my 18 inch floor, Tom, and I'm problem with it, but I'm used to playing it. But I think if someone else came on my kit, they might be like, Ur! might feel this a little uh, more of a reach, if you will. Yeah. You got to get used to it. I had that, um, on my rocker kit, I had that, kind of contraption I'll call it where it was the clamp on uh the hi-hat three old three-leg hi-hat stand which a two-leg hi-hat stand you turn it you kind of get sort of uh you can kind of get it up in that little corner area closer to it but like like sure. you said but um it was the thing that had the uh you know whatever clamp on the hi-hat the little arm on the bass drum where you could close the legs and attach the hi-hat to the bass drum yeah. which was obviously to solve that problem that you're talking about of having, because if you have to have your hi-hat uh, pedal an extra foot over because the legs are set up in a certain way, that can get uncomfortable. Then you're walking like you've been riding a horse for uh, <laughs> a long time. For sure. And and it's, it's not kind of fun. After a while, you're like hip yeah. bones are just kind of like, so you got to take care yeah. of yourself and, and for sure. listen to your body. And it might not even be in that and also it might be you might not be serving the music. It might take too long to get your foot from one place to the other or back and forth. And so yeah. you might miss that note or that quick little flourish that you're trying to get done. So I think it all yeah. just yeah, it goes about how do you set it up? Is it comfortable for you? Doesn't matter if it's comfortable for someone else, it's gotta be comfortable for you. 
yeah exactly and 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 mess with it and tweak it and yeah. uh because it's i feel like part of the fun of having such a giant drum set is like experimenting and setting things up um differently yeah. which on that note let's hear about your really cool story about getting your dream drum set sure. uh and again for for people kind of listening describe it you know if you're if you're watching you can see it obviously behind um kyle this entire time but um just tell us all about your you know acquiring this awesome drum set sure so for me this is a lifetime of uh you know wanting a massive massive kit you know i grew up like I said in the 80s when this all power times and big kits were totally in vogue and um, I can remember, so I was in the military and back in 2010, I was in Hawaii and uh, my parents were still in Connecticut. And uh, I remember I talked to my dad on the phone. I was like, you know, I really miss playing the drums. I hadn't played in a couple of years. And I'm like, I really want to buy a nice top of the line kit. You know, I can afford something a little nicer now and a little older. And, uh, but they're so expensive. And he's like, you know, just start saving five bucks here and there. And he said, eventually you'll have enough if you just stay. And it, easier said than done right you're like oh my god like do you know how much these things yeah. are and so yeah, um, it's like five bucks is a drop in the bucket on a I, I don't know how much yours was but i mean these things can be five six seven thousand dollars easily plus i mean oh sure so uh it's funny um my, my dad wasn't a big music person so uh that was i don't get all down but that was the last he he passed away unexpectedly just a couple days later after that conversation um, oh my gosh i'm sorry oh uh, thank you but uh it was a great conversation because we talked about drums and music. So for me, that was like, yeah. what an awesome, you know, conversation to have with him. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, his words carried with me, you know, save, 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 be diligent. So it took me 10 years to save. I saved for 10 years. And then, um, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to buy my kit all at once. I didn't want to like piece it together a couple years later, buy something. And then something I wanted it produced all at the same time for like a quality and consistency. And so what I have here is that it's a Pearl reference. Uh, behind me, not the reference pure, but a reference because the, they're the thicker shells, a little heavier, a little more sturdy. And um, it took 10 years to save, and then it took one year and two months for Pearl to produce it and <laughs> send it to me. Um, wow. So it took a really long time, but, you know, global pandemic delays, you know, because of the all that stuff. So totally understand it just happens that way. Um, yeah. But this was like a lifetime for me of uh, saving and just, you know, getting what I really wanted. So I'm just going to pan that over so people can see yeah. a little bit more of the my little kit there um Fun. yeah your little kit there <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well go, run through again kind of i mean so what's the finish so it's um they call it scarlet sparkle burst so it's uh cool. gets a little darker as it goes outwards um and uh it's in power tom sizes basically so i have eight rack toms so like kind of like the genesis kit this has a six by eight an eight by eight a ten by ten a twelve by ten 13 by 11, 14 by 12, I almost forgot, <laughs> uh, 15 <laughs> by 13, and then the last big one over there, and that's a 16 by 14 inch mounted Tom Tom, and then I have the standard two floors, 16 by 16 and 18 by 16, and then I took a chance. I originally was going to do like a 22 by 20 inch bass drums, something a little longer, but I thought about it for a while, and I was like, you know, I really want a 24 inch bass drum, something a little bigger, more volume, and so um, that was twofold. The, the real reason is for the sound, because it's pretty thunderous sound in my opinion a 24 inch bass drum and then also they're two inches taller so for me um that helped with the smaller rack times like i have six eight ten twelve and so it helps with the the hi-hat stand so having the taller bass drum the drums are just a little higher and it's just easier yeah. to go down the toms um so that was just kind of an accident accidental benefit uh of that uh, totally. but i really i really love the 24 inch bass drums if you haven't played a 24 inch kick drum man they're just fun super thunderous beefy loud so, uh, yeah, and this is, you know, pending a, a lottery when, you know, I'm not buying another kit. This is it. <laughs> yeah. After 10 years, it's so cool. I mean, there's nothing wrong with buying a piece here. I've done that where you buy a piece here. Like I, I, <laughs> I like cheapo, uh, bought a DW set where I bought like a Tom on eBay and sure. I bought a floor Tom at like Columbus pro percussion. And I used a Ludwig bass drum, which didn't, which I think I got rewrapped, which so was cheating, but I was like. 13 or 14 years old, but yeah. it wasn't the same. It wasn't ordering your beautiful drum set and opening the box and it's all together. I mean, congratulations. That is so cool. You 10 Thanks. years of work and it's just unbelievable. It's a lot of fun. Yo, if you're ever in the area, you're always welcome to come over and play. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah. A lot of variety, a lot of 
a lot of fun. You know, you can do a million different things with it. So lots yeah. of different music. And just because you have, like, in my case, I have a big hit, doesn't mean I actually have to play everything all at once in every song. You know, so you guys got to be able to keep the pocket, keep the groove, you know, serve yeah. the song. But if you're just playing for fun, then go nuts. <laughs> do you ever split it up and just, like, like uh, have you like gigged out with this kit or uh, I mean, it's been the pandemic for a long time. So things have changed, but w- do you ever just like, I'm going to use kick snare two time, you know, five piece kit or something to kind of split it up. I haven't split it up yet. Um, I actually don't get to play as often as I want. I travel a lot for work. Um, sure. And so setting it up in its entirety is kind of like, has been my goal, you know, yeah, to that's get the awesome. kit. Um, but I think eventually, you know, fooling around with it here and there like you said bart would be would pretty cool because i think at the end of the day if you have a five piece or 15 piece you got to switch it up a little bit to kind of stir creativity and you know come up with some different things so i think yep. eventually you know maybe maybe i'll do a six eight mounted tom with you know a bass and snare, you know something like that or go super deep yeah. um but just some, you know change it up just do something it's different fun yeah. yeah man cool so you already said that you you got some help from um, Remo and Tama, which uh, really cool of those companies um, to do that and to help out. Um, yeah. Any other anything you want to like shout out here at the end or anything like that? Um, I I do want to thank. Uh, I also talked with um, Yamaha. I talked to them about their Rock Tour Custom, which I forgot to talk about earlier, um, and they just came out and said you know that was a gen- that just was a natural extension of their Tour Custom kits and their Turbo their Rock Tour with their Rock turbo tour custom as a mouthful um, <laughs> tongue twister <laughs> yeah essentially that was a limited series that came out in the uh, late 80s also uh the difference is is they were in power tom sizes and then they didn't do the long lug they did the the single or you know lug no the non-connecting lug kind of like on the reference kit to cut down on some of the hardware weight because those shells were so thick um yep. so i want to thank them again uh because every every all the drum companies and manufacturers i reached out to they all were super kind enough to you know get back to me and answer my questions so i'd say like, thank thank all them because they didn't have to do that so i, I appreciate all their time it took as well and then i guess the last thing i'd add is um you know my inspiration is drummer is eric carr and though he played ludwig's you know i have a pearl kit and i'm just you know i find that you know as a drummer i whatever works for me product wise is what i'm going to stick with um but you know eric played ludwig's his whole career but i still got my kind of kit in a pearl um, totally and this is actually, it's funny, we're doing it this week. This is the anniversary of his passing. So if you're a new drummer or new to drumming, I encourage everyone to kind of Google Eric Carr, look at some of his videos um, on his anniversary. I think, uh, you know, uh, he's pretty inspiring as a drummer, I find. And uh, he's got some great chops. And uh, I think you'll you'll like his solo and all his stuff he does on the drums. Cool. That is awesome. That is a first where someone has said, you know, at the end, kind of like, what do you want to shout out? a recommendation of a drummer for people to check out. And I think that's super cool. Uh, and, and a great, uh, yeah, I mean, air car is awesome. Um, sad that he passed away obviously, but, um, that's, I guess that's just life. And, and he's obviously in, inspired you and, and a, and a whole bunch of other drummers. So, um, Kyle, yeah, man, this has been awesome. I just, uh, appreciate so much that, uh, you did the work and you were pretty fast about putting this together. And, and, and obviously it's something you're passionate about. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it probably learning more and doing research about these drum sets probably increased your love of power time drum sets because now you know more about them, you know, and the different brands. Absolutely. I hope uh, everyone kind of uh, embraces them just a little bit more. I know they're not for everybody. Totally get it. Um, But, uh, you know, they're a lot of fun to play, whether you have a four piece or a 12 piece, you know, power times are just kind of a fun drum to kind of play. Yeah, totally. On that note, Kyle, thank you for being here, my friend. And uh, thank you for listening to the show. And now you're on the show. It's just super cool. So I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Bart. And uh, I just want to say again, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing you've done for the drumming community. I have learned so much in the last year since I've been, since I found your podcast and started listening to it, you know, the history of drumming. I think you've provided a great, a great um, basket of knowledge for every drummer to dig in and everyone can take something different out of it. And, And now it's here on the record for, you know, forever. So I think you've done a wonderful job. So thanks so much for everything you've done. Thank you. Thanks, man. That means a lot to hear that from, uh, from someone who's listened to it and and appreciated it and and relatively new to the show from, from listening for the past year. So, uh, that's awesome, man. I appreciate it, Kyle. Thanks, Bart. Appreciate it. 